Hi class, this is your instructor, Skylar Huff, and welcome to Chapter 15, DNA Technology and Genomics. Beginning in the mid-1970s, the development of recombinant DNA technology led to radically new research approaches in which researchers splice together DNA from different organisms in the laboratory. One goal of this technology is to enable scientists to obtain many copies of a specific DNA segment for study. Because of new methods to analyze DNA are continually emerging, we do not attempt to explore all of them here. We instead discuss some of the major approaches that have provided a foundation for the technologies commonly used by molecular biologists. We then consider how studies of DNA sequences have helped scientists understand the organization of genes and the relationship between genes and their products. In fact, most of our knowledge of the structure and control of genes and the roles of genes in development come from applying these methods. DNA sequencing has also revolutionized systematics by clarifying many evolutionary relationships. This chapter also explores some of the practical applications of DNA technologies. Altering the DNA of an organism to produce new genes with new traits called genetic engineering is used in many ways, ranging from basic research to the production of strains of bacteria that manufacture useful products and to, develop, to the development of plants and animals that express foreign genes, such as you all see being shown to you now. At the bottom of your screen, that is a genetically engineered zebrafish, which of course is Denia Rio, and it carries a gene from a jellyfish that codes for a fluorescent protein. There you have it. The development of DNA cloning and related techniques has led to the emergence of biotechnology, which is the commercial or industrial use of cells or organisms. Today, biotechnology includes numerous applications in such diverse areas as medicine, foods and agriculture, and forensic science. Let us now begin class with the process of DNA cloning. Recombinant DNA technology was not developed quickly. Its roots came from the 1940s with genetic studies of bacteria and bacteriophages. Meaning a bacteriophage is a virus that infects, of course, bacterium. So it was Berg who first had the construct of the common DNA in 1980, and he's shared a Nobel Prize for chemistry, for chemistry with his contributions. So traditionally, recombinant DNA technology, scientists use restriction, restriction enzymes. And when I speak to restriction enzymes, they come from bacteria, and they cut DNA molecules into specific, in specific places very specific places. So restriction enzymes enable researchers to cut DNA into manageable segments. And then each fragment is then incorporated into a suitable vector molecule that will carry that capable, a carrier capable of transporting the DNA fragment into the cell. So bacteriophages and DNA molecules called plasmids are two examples of vectors. And as I say this, the, the bacterial DNA is generally circular, and most plasmids are separate and much smaller circular DNA molecules that may also be present inside of a bacterial cell, such as E. coli. Let's just say this is some quote-unquote bacterial cell. This would be the circular chromosome. And then here is that bacterial plasmid. So I'll just say this portion here would be the nucleoid. And of course I said that portion is the bacterial plasmid. There you go. <clears throat> So these plasmids, 
they are, of course, present in bacteria such as E. coli. And then what researchers do is they introduce plasmids into bacterial cells by the process known as transformation. For instance, as it's called cloning, meaning what happens is when you have this a plasma that enters a cell, it is then replicated and distributed among daughter cells during division. And when you, that recombinant plasmid is there, and note, a recombinant plasmid has DNA from, of course, one foreign DNA spliced into it. It replicates and gets many copies of that foreign DNA that are made, thereby cloning that foreign DNA. So, so the, the way in which it works is, let's just go to the process. And I'm kind of here with, re, with restriction enzymes. But with bacterial cloning is when you insert a single gene into bacteria. So we take these restriction enzymes and they cut that DNA plasmid and the DNA from the donor source. So you must cut them both, both the plasmid from the bacterium and the DNA from the and the DNA from the donor source, such as the DNA that would have come from, of course, that jellyfish that has that protein that allows it to glow. So when the DNA when the restriction enzymes cut the DNA at specific nucleotide sequences. Of course, you have that gene of interest. So it, it's known class genomes these days. Genomes are known, the entire genome. So when you know what gene of interest is, you, of course, get the appropriate restriction enzyme, of course, as I said earlier, that come from bacteria to cut that gene. So when the DNA is cut, there are sticky ends that are created. So, of course, as you have those sticky ends, what is then done is that the same restriction enzyme must be used on both the plasmid and donor source. So we create, or you create conditions for the bacteria to take up that recombined plasmid. And this is a process of transformation. So once that has occurred, you can then incubate. You can then incubate the transformed bacteria in the presence of an antibiotic you select only for the transformed cells. Transformed bacteria then reproduce by way of binary fission to achieve a large working population. The transformed cells can then express that gene of interest. And this is done, class, I would say, day after day after day, because, of course, you can even look at bottles. And you can even look at medicines especially, I mean bottles of, such as a vial of medicine, but it would say right there that, that that's inside the bottle, that vial of medicine, came from an RDNA origin, i.e. a recombinant DNA origin. So that is it, and it is that class. So let us now continue. And this class shows, of course, the very same thing class, a plasmid. So within this plasmid, of course, we have there is a, you can look at this class on page 318. So within this plasmid, of course, we have resistant genes for the, antibi the antibiotic class, ampicil ampicillin, as well as tetracycline. So there you have ampicillin is there. And of course, tetracycline is there. Of course, we have the E. coli, original replication there. And then, of course, we have the yeast gene, which is there, the URA3. And, of course, you also are seeing there that it was cut class by way of those restriction enzymes. And you can see those being their class going around kind of concentrically, concentrically class, and they're abbreviated by species. So next up is gel electrophoresis. So the process of gel electrophoresis class is what creates a DNA fingerprint. And I say this process is, I gotta say, amazing class. And it's amazing for obviously a number of ways. So with gel electrophoresis, these DNA, well, it's done to confirm that the DNA fragment is properly cloned. The scientists must cut this amplified plasmids using the same restricted enzymes from the cloning procedure. So if the plasma contains recombinant DNA, then the restriction 
enzyme products should include DNA molecules consisting of the original plasmid and the clone sequence. So these DNA fragments class can then be separated and identified by geoelectrophoresis. So it's by way of this process that is used to separate mixtures of macromolecules, which of course includes proteins, polypeptides, DNA fragments, or even RNA. So it's not just for DNA. It's not going to be class done with proteins. So it exploits the charge groups class, and with that, the molecules, they cause them to migrate in an electrical field. So let's get to how this process works, because they'll go class, at least, of course, the nucleic acids, toward the positive pole, because, of course, nucleic acids are negatively charged because they're phosphate groups. So they will then separate class according to size. The smaller molecules will move farther and faster than the larger molecules. So the, let's go through the process. So we have different DNA samples or different protein samples, different polypeptide samples, or even different RNA samples. So they expose, of course, that same restriction enzyme. This creates restriction fragment length polymorphisms. I say again, this creates class restriction fragment length polymorphisms. That's RFLPs. So these are fragments of DNA having different lengths cut using restriction enzymes. So the DNA restriction fragment length polymorphisms all loaded into an agarose gel, which we are looking at here. That's the gel. And, of course, you turn on the electricity. So the electricity class would be something with a number of volts, such as that power source there. And, of course, here's that positive power source there. So within which class, there is a buffer solution, which is mentioned here. And what's being pipetted with a micropipetter class, of course, are those samples. So this may be sample C, sample B, and even class sample A. Or maybe samples 1, 2, and 3. And, in, in, and what I'll also say is class, that first one that I have here, class, indicated by my red arrow, we could say that would be that standard. And I say the standard because these are those known, those known sizes. So it might be that this one class here is 20 base pairs. It might be that this class is 100 base pairs. It might be this, this one class is 1,000 base pairs. But those are known so that we can compare these class by, of course, where they are in relationship class to our ladder sequence class, indicated right here by those two arrows. So, of course, these restriction fragment length polymorphisms will separate a class according to size or length of fragments in base pairs. Let us now continue. So, up next class is the process known as polymerase chain reaction. You'll find this class on page 318. So, polymerase chain reaction amplifies DNA in vitro. So, the methods just described for amplifying or making multiple copies of DNA a specific DNA sequence involved cloning the DNA in cells, usually of those of bacteria. These processes are time-consuming and require adequate DNA samples as a starting point. The process of polymerase chain reaction, however, which, of course, Kerry Mullis developed in 1985, allows researchers to amplify a tiny sample of DNA without cloning a cell. So using this procedure, the DNA is amplified into millions of times in a few hours. So the amplified DNA fragments can then be placed into a cloning vector or used for a number of other purposes. And in 1993, Mullis did receive the Nobel Prize in chemistry for his work. So in PCR, DNA polymerase uses the nucleotides, primers, of course, which of course are synthetic polynucleotides, to replicate DNA sequence in vitro, meaning outside of the human organism or outside of the organism itself, be it, of course, plant, bacterium, fungus, and thereby producing two DNA molecules. So let's get to the process here briefly. So as PCR works, of course, it amplifies a single DNA molecule into a large workable sample of 100% identical molecules. So the DNA is placed into a thermocycler because, of course, we must have this tool, we must have this thermocycler class that, that will do this. So as it's put into the thermal cycler, of course, this is an automatic equipment class that will heat and cool the reaction mixture repeatedly. So as it happens, class, the DNA is placed into the thermal cycler. 
the thermocycloclast will then heat and separate the double helix of DNA so that replication can occur. So the DNA primers are then attached to the DNA template strand to start replication. So as those two strands of DNA are denatured as it heats, the cooling phases class will then allow those primers to pair with the target sequence, which of course are replicated by DNA polymerase, working class in the five prime to three prime direction. Attaching nucleosides to the growing new side of the replicated DNA molecule. So this the first cycle generates two double stranded molecules. The second cycle generates four DNA molecules. The third cycle generates eight DNA molecules. So the number of DNA molecules class doubles in each cycle. And after 20 heating and cooling cycles, this exponential process class proceeds and yields 2 to the 20, I repeat, 2 to the 20th power class or more than 1 million copies of that target sequence. So because the reaction can be carried out efficiently class, it, 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 it can only be carried out efficiently if the DNA polymerase can be stable through the many heat, heating cycles. So researchers use a heat-resistant DNA polymerase known as TAC polymerase. There it is, TAC polymerase. And of course, nucleopotides and primers to replicate DNA and of course, in vitro. So as you see a class, we have two molecules, as I mentioned earlier, class, from the first cycle, four from the next cycle, eight from that next cycle. There it is. And if you've wondered about this class, the name TAC for TAC polymerase is this enzyme reflects the source. It's come, it comes from Thermus aquaticus class, and that bacterium is, is what lives in the hot springs of Yellowstone National Park. And because the water in this environment is close to the boiling point, all enzymes in Thermus aquaticus class have evolved to be similar at very high temperatures. Similar heat resistant enzymes have evolved in bacteria or archaea living in deep sea thermal vents. So, of course, this can be used, meaning PCR class has enabled researchers to amplify and analyze tiny DNA samples from a variety of sources ranging from crime scenes to archaeological remains. So it's used to analyze even class, the mitochondrial DNA obtained from the bones of the Neanderthals. Applications. So let's get next to class to cDNA clones. Let us begin. So all the DNA in a cell is referred to as the genome, and researchers frequently wish to clone genes from eukaryotic organisms while avoiding introns, the regions that do not encode proteins. So if a protein encoding gene is, is cloned from the eukaryotic cell using PCR from genomic DNA, from genomic DNA the coding sequences of the clone will, will probably be interrupted by numerous introns. In such cases, Researchers can construct clones from DNA copies of mature RNAs from which introns have been removed. The copies are known as complementary DNA or cDNA because they are complementary to mRNA and also lack the introns. And this is done via the process known as reverse transcriptase PCR or RT PCR. And this is utterly amazing, class. So from here, the clone C DNA sequences class are then useful when geneticists want to reproduce a eukaryotic protein in bacteria. This class is what saves lives because many times class, that is what's done. I can't stress enough. It's going to be our proteins class made by, synthesized class by a bacterium. Continuing on, class, to CRISPR-based technologies. So with CRISPR-based technologies, it's undergoing a radical transformation in the discovery of the use of clusters of regularly interspersed short palindromic repeats. So CRISPR endonuclease systems is what it is. So the function of CRISPR, CRISPR endonucleases were first discovered in 2007 through study of the gene expression of the streptococcus 
thermophilus bacterium. So it's an industrial organism used in the production of yogurts and cheese. So the CRISPR loci had been previously detected in a number of microorganisms by gene sequencing, but their function was unknown. So a typical CRISPR locus, meaning consists of repeating sequences of about 40 base pairs that are interrupted with unique sequences derived from the DNA of bacteriophages that had previously invaded the bacterial cells. These repeated sequences are typically linked to one or more CAS or CRISPR-associated protein genes that encode endonucleases, enzymes that cut DNA, much like restriction enzymes. So these loci were found to be a defense mechanism against invading bacteriophages that attacked bacterial cultures. And of course, that would cause spoiling the production of the cultured food. And today, most cultured dairy products are produced ge with genetically modified CRISPRized cells designed to resist bacteriophage infections. So almost all bacteria and archaeal arche arche genomes that have been sequenced have now been found to contain CRISPR-Cas loci as part of their defense systems. Unlike restriction enzymes, which are proteins that can cut only one specific DNA sequence, class, this is where it gets good. CRISPR-Cas enzymes are ribonucleoproteins consisting of a protein endonuclease and a guide RNA molecule transcribed from the repeated sequence in the locus. So when the homologous RNA portion of the guide RNA pairs with a target DNA molecule, the enzymes can cut a DNA sequence class near the paired region. So in 2012, what happened here is we had Jennifer Dudna and Emmanuel Trapatinio published a paper in Science describing a genetically engineered system using CRISPR-Cas9 locus from streptococcus that can be programmed to edit genes using synthetic RNA sequences. So by simply modifying the sequence within the guide RNA, the CRISPR-based enzyme can create a double-strand break in virtually any host DNA. Furthermore, an engineered CRISPR gene locus or the Cas9 protein with appropriate synthetic guide RNA sequences can be incorporated into growing cells of almost all species from bacteria to humans class. This allows researchers class to modify or edit the host genes in those cells in many ways. These methods bypass many traditional and time-consuming methods of cloning class, modifying or introducing recombinant genes to produce transgenic organisms. Hence class, CRISPR-based engineering systems are now used today in applications ranging from basic research to commercial applications that involve entering of agricultural or medical products. Research is yet underway class on the potential of CRISPR system to edit germline cells to correct human genetic diseases in those genes before they're passed on to future generations. So these CRISPR tools are widely used to edit, delete, or replace target gene sequences within a host cell chromosome of many different species. So many of these tools exploit the ability of the host cell to repair the DNA sequence cut by CRISPR endonuclease using the cell's endogenous DNA repair mechanisms. So I can't stress enough, class, that cells of most species, yes, they have systems that can detect repair and breaks in the DNA using homologous DNA repair, using homologous DNA repair. However, class, what's happening now with CRIS class, CRISPR-Cas9, is going to change the world. So as I mentioned, I went through this already, class, but this is called CRISPR-Cas9, and it, class, can edit DNA. And yes, in living organisms. So if if ever you wanted to, to do something, I would say this would be something class to, I guess I would say, strive to be able to do and do well. So I, I can't stress enough class, if you'd like to change your major, today would be a great day. Come to biology class and of course, learn this information and get to the point where you, of course, are able to use that Cas9 guide RNA to cut out a mutant gene as you're looking at your class cut a mutant gene, and of course, once that has been done, repair the chromosome class with that normal gene. Class, this is going to change the entire world. So if you haven't heard of it, 
you haven't heard of it. You have now heard of it. All right. So now we, let's get to other tools for studying DNA. So briefly, class here with the slim block. So with the development of, of recombinant DNA methods that revolutionized class, the way scientists could study genes and the ways they were, were expressed, many of the findings in the early studies relied on the, on the development of gel electrophoresis botting methods. So using homologous probes produced from the cloned DNA sequences, scientists can identify and measure, D measure specific DNA fragments and RNAs from cells and tissues that were separated by gel electrophoresis. The DNA Southern blot method, named after, of course, Edwin Southern, allowed investigators to discriminate between the normal and muted alleles of a gene with a restriction fragment length polymorphism. So with the, by all by using a DNA probe class. The northern blot is using RNA. So RNA is separated by electrophoresis and then transferred to a membrane to detect a nucleic acid probe. And then western blot, of course, is when the blot consists of proteins or polypeptides separated by gel electrophoresis. So the southern blot method distinguishes between the normal and mutant alleles. And of course, let's now get to where it gets even more interesting class with DNA sequencing. So machines connected to powerful computers class can sequence huge amounts of DNA quickly and reliably. And this, of course, uses the chain termination method based on the fact that a replacing DNA strand that incorporates a modified synthetic nucleotide cannot elongate beyond that point. So as it happens, almost all sequencing of DNA class today is carried out through an automated machine. And initially class DNA sequencing relied on the chain termination method. And to sequence a DNA fragment, radioactively labeled fragments from four different reaction mixtures, each with a different deoxynucleotide are separated by a high-resolution gel electrophoresis. So the positions of the newly synthesized fragments can then be determined by audio radiography, and because of the high-resolution gel can separate DNA fragments that differ in length by only one or at least a single nucleotide, a researcher can read off the sequence in the newly synthesized DNA one base at a time. The Sanger method class was a time-consuming procedure. Typically, class, no more than a few hundred bases could be sequenced in a single run, and could take five days to complete. Well, today's next generation automated sequencing class employs shotgun sequencing methods to first cut genomic DNA into millions of short fragments. So these fragments are all sequenced at the same time. And most next generation sequencing machines first amplify each 100 to 300 base pairs fragments by PCR creating multiple copies that are clustered in a well on a plate containing millions of wells holding other amplified fragments. The DNA clusters are then subject to cyclic DNA synthesis, one nucleotide at a time, by sequentially flooding the plate with different reaction mixtures. Each mixture contains one of the four fluorescent labeled nucleotides, and after each cycle, the plate is exposed to a laser allowing sensitive photodetectors to identify those wells in which a new base was added. This is followed by a step that remo removes the fluorescent label from the end of the chain so that the new base can be added. Computers then assemble the sequences class by overlapping fragments onto long reads that can be mapped to the genome. These next generation machines can decode class about one and a half million bases in a 24 hour period, dramatically class, increasing the speed and reducing the cost of DNA sequences. These advances class in rapid I repeat, these advances in rapid sequencing today have made it possible for researchers to, to determine nucleoside sequences of entire genomes in a wide variety of bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotic organisms. So there are gene databases class that are out here, and this all dated back to, of course, the Human Genome Project, which began in 1990, and resulted in the sequencing class of the 3 billion base pairs of the human genome in 2001, along with the genomes of other model org organisms, including class yeasts, which of course you may have heard of, E. coli, and nematode class, and even Drosophila melanogaster. Almost all the first genome data from the project was derived using the Sanger chain termination method. So today class, genomes of thousands of, of organisms are all 
of all three domains of life have been sequenced, and scientists now rely on massive databases that even you yourselves, class, I repeat, that even you yourselves can access and use. So one such place, class, of course, is here before you. You can also use the International Nucleotide Sequence Database Collection. Of course, there's NCBI, which you're looking at here. There are just so many different ways to do it. And then reverse transcription is used to measure gene expression. So of course, DNA microarrays, the glass slides with hundreds of microdots, use reverse transcribed methods of mRNA to study large-scale patterns of gene expression. So geneticists also use powerful, I repeat, powerful class bioinformatics software and supercomputers to provide these databases to compare newly discovered sequences and analyze gene expression structures. And I'll put it this way, class. If you like computers, and if you like science, I can assure you, class, that you should, hey, change a major, and, and of course, class, begin to learn any of these processes. So with this class, someone can enter newly determined human gene, gene sequences into the analysis software, and of course, this information can provide clues into the function of the gene, and the structural features about its encoded protein. And I can even provide information for that with access I have. So now on to genomics. So this is a study of the entire DNA sequence of an organism's genome, to identify all the genes, determine their RNA and protein products, and how genes are regulated. So GWAS, or Genome-Wide Association Studies, collect simultaneous sequence, expression, and functional data from entire genome analysis. So if you would like to discover any of this class, I say please contact me as soon as you can because this is where science is now, using computers. And of course, the knowledge of DNA. So of course, genome, genome analysis of commercially important organisms is a priority. And with RNA interference, I won't speak to that, but with gene targeting class, you just knock out a gene and once you, of course, use those knockout mice, you study the roles of the orthologous genes with unknown functions. So this is used, class, in many times. And even the knockout gene is cloned, introduced into mouse embryonic stem cells, and they were injected into early mice. So this is done, class. And the way it's done is to ensure we can find out what and why. So now let's get to applications of... And one thing I forgot before I get to that applications, I don't know how I forgot, but one thing I did forget was looking at single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNMPs. These class are pretty important in that they are associated class with not just cancer, but many genetic diseases in humans. And if in fact you're interested, let me know because there is a, pro a program that I'm involved in class looking at variants, looking at variants, and they are nothing more than those single nucleotide polymorphisms. So now to end things, class, with applications. Applications galore, class. Recombinant DNA technology has helped us examine, and I say us, those fundamental questions about cells, as well as new approaches to how those apply problems. So this goes, class, from medicine to, of course, criminal investigation, and even transgenic organism production. So DNA technology in the medicine class is, of course, the way in which we get to those, of course, particularly genetic mutation associated disorders, such as cystic fibrosis or Tay-Sachs disease, sickle cell anemia, Huntington's disease, and even breast cancer. And of course, gene therapy uses specific DNA to treat a genetic disease by correcting that problem. So here, class, recombinant DNA technologies are used to produce so many proteins by using, of course, bacteria. So insulin class, I've seen it in many of those. Human growth hormone. TPA class, which is tissue plasminogen activator. That's used class when someone has a stroke. And there's a time factor with it. It's so much that's here class. So even clotting factor class. Vaccines class for influenza. Hepatitis. Polio. Thanks a lot, Henry Delax. HPV. 
class, it spans, I would say, so many different areas. And it's all here using recombinant DNA. And even with the DNA fingerprinting. So there are a number of applications here, class. So with this, they look at short tandem repeats, at least. These are very powerful class. These STRs, short tandem repeats are, because they're a different class. And they differ from, of course, person to person. And just using those class, it's saved lives. And of course, it's used at 20 different markers. And by using that class, you can, of course, determine whether it was suspect one, two, or three who did the crime. And let's just look at this class. Which of the three suspects did the crime? And then lastly, further applications class. So, of course, forensic analysis at the crime scene, identifying mass disaster victims, pedigree verification, and, of course, dogs. Human, of course, cancer cell lines, identifying those. Endangered species studies. Planet food tracking. Human genetic ancestry, such as you may buy for someone for a Christmas present with Ancestry.com or 23andMe. Paternity testing. And even class exonerating those who were wrongly convicted, such as with the Innocence Project, which I say is one of the most amazing things here on Earth. So with transgenic organisms class, it deals with plants and animals in which foreign genes have been incorporated. So of course, those animals are usually produced by injecting DNA of a particular gene into the nucleus of a fertilized egg or cell. And of course, a retrovirus may be used as a recombinant DNA vector as well. So as you see in here class, they are used. So the mouse on the right is normal, whereas the mouse on the left is transgenic. And of course, it has rat growth hormone expressed in larger amounts. There you go. Farming class is also a big, meaning producing transgenic livestock that secrete from proteins into the milk of therapeutic or commercial importance. And this is done class, and hence you see that milk that's their class with the protein then purified from the milk. So the protein or the gene does not harm the animal at all. It's of course for us. So that way, of course, we have a milk that we can drink regardless class of what used to be in the milk that we could not digest. So as this is done class, the shotgun method is done to produce transient plants. If they shotgun those plants, they shotgun those plants, and if you look in your textbook on page 333, you will see it. So the field test of transient corn with resistant drought, as opposed to that, that is not re resistant to drought. So of course, you see this one that's here is that one class that will have those yields much higher because it is drought resistant. And they just do a class by shotgunning it. And if you're interested in class learning more about this, I can definitely go in, into further depth. But of course, they, the very same way. All across the globe class, I wanted to make sure I knew about these genetically modified crops here, GM crops. So we are the world's top producer class. I won't mention the company that does it for reasons maybe not known to you. But over half class of the global screen crop is modified. A third of the cotton crop, corn crop, is to be modified. Approximately 30% of the cotton crop is modified and approximately 5% of canola are all genetically modified crops. And they're resistant class to things such as fungal diseases, viral pathogens, insect pests, especially class, heat, cold, especially herbicide, especially herbicide. And of course, depending on the soil being acidic, salty, or drought. So they can be engineered class to increase nutrition or to produce medicinally important proteins. And as this happens, class, there is then a label class that those foods are then labeled as genetically modified food. So this class doesn't necessarily affect a person's health, but of course many people class say that it does affect them. And with CRISPR-based gene drives, the gene drives of course is just spreading modified gene sequences throughout the population to, of course, target disease vectors, such as, of course, mosquitoes that carry the dengue fever. 
And I won't speak to, of course, the pandemic occurring now, or at least as I record this, but that's one thing, class, to consider. One thing to most definitely consider. So with safety concerns, class, just keep in mind that, yes, with unit technology, a lot can be done. But of course, this should be taken into account, class. Not just, of course, safety, but also, class, I guess what you call ethics. Ethics. Ethics, ethics, because of course, potential misuses. Potential misuses. So this has been your instructor, Skylar Huff. Thank you all for listening and prepare well class for your test.